Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Little grips people's imaginations like stories of what might have been. Alternative histories where zeppelins fill the skies. The Nazis won World War II. JFK was never assassinated. One such speculative tale revolves around a subject already heady with conspiracy and legend, the Apollo moon landings. We can only imagine what alternative history would have unfolded if the program had not been canceled but continued to explore the moon. But one man claims the program was not canceled. In fact, He claims that Apollo 18, 19, and 20 did, in fact, go to the moon, despite what was reported. And what Apollo 20 found was beyond incredible. It was downright unbelievable. On the other side of the moon, a crashed alien spacecraft, complete with the dead bodies of its crew. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… It was in 2006 when Jennifer Keyes disappeared from her Florida home without a trace. What happened to her? We'll look inside this case that is still a mystery. In 1894, a massive fire broke out in the forests of Minnesota, killing more than 400 people. Do their ghosts remain behind with the ashes? A teenager tells how ghosts are just part of day-to-day living for her family. One of the most well-known explorers, Christopher Columbus, had a signature that was so perplexing that most scholars believe it a secret code of some kind, and so far, an unbreakable code at that. Some victims died because they happened to leave their doors unlocked. Others had been methodically stalked. How do serial killers choose their victims? We'll look at the methods of nine of the most notorious serial killers in history. When Jeffrey Dampier won the lottery, he thought he had finally had it all. Little did he know that someone was about to take everything from him. They found Annie stretched out on the floor with a pistol lying by her hand. There was no sign of struggle and nothing had been taken. They could only conclude that Annie had taken her own life. But is that really what happened? When you think of seeing a ghost, you almost automatically envision an ethereal being in flowing white, like that of a woman in a wedding dress. And that might make sense, seeing as there are a lot of dead brides-to-be floating around America. You've seen them on the outside of large Gothic buildings and massive churches. Their stone faces and menacing presence can be unsettling to some. But what are the purpose of gargoyles? Were Betty and Barney Hill actually visited and even abducted by aliens in 1961, or was it an outlandish story just to get attention? The village of Trasmos in Spain is said to be cursed by witches. Could there be truth in the lore? But first, did a secret Apollo mission to the dark side of the moon discover an ancient alien life form? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. A 
Official history tells us that the last time man ever went to the moon was in December 1972, when Apollo 17 astronauts Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt spent a record-breaking three days on the lunar surface. But more Apollo missions were originally planned, Apollo 18, 19, and 20 having already begun construction or in the latter planning stages when they were canceled in 1972, a combination of declining public interest and budget cuts making the once prestigious moon program fall out of favor in Washington. Science fiction can speculate on what would have happened if these programs had gone ahead. Perhaps we would have habitable colonies on the moon today, or staging posts for trips to Mars, and maybe we would have explored the dark side of the moon long rumored to contain remnants of an ancient alien civilization. In 2007, a mysterious figure took to YouTube with evidence that this incredible scenario was not speculative fiction, but a clandestine fact, one hidden from the world to protect the truth about what they had found on Earth's closest neighbor. A user calling himself Retired AFB posted a number of videos purporting to be footage of a secret Apollo 20 mission, jointly manned by U.S. and Soviet astronauts that took place in August of 1976. Retired AFB identified himself as William Rutledge, a now elderly and retired NASA astronaut in exile in Rwanda who took part in the secret Apollo 20 mission alongside fellow astronauts Leona Marietta Snyder and Alexei Leonov. According to Rutledge, Apollo 20's mission was to explore the polar region of the Moon on its dark side to investigate images supposedly taken by Apollo 15 of the area which showed what appeared to be a vast ancient city and a huge miles-long crashed spacecraft. Rutledge's footage would be astonishing if true, as it shows both the alien city and a flyover of the cigar-shaped spaceship. The videos then cut to the Apollo 20 crew, actually exploring the interior of the crashed ship, and perhaps most amazing of all, discovering the body of a human-like alien. Dubbed Mona Lisa by the astronauts, the body appeared to have been that of a young woman, partially mummified with a thin layer of a waxy substance covering its skin. She appeared to be locked into the controls of the spacecraft by a device connected to her eyes and nose. In an interview with an Italian journalist, Luca Scantamberlo, Rutledge went into more details about their discovery of Mona Lisa, explaining that the EBE, extraterrestrial biological entity, appeared to be neither alive or dead but in some kind of state of suspended animation. According to Rutledge, the alien was disconnected from the navigational device and returned back to Earth aboard the lunar module, where the body still resides today. Rutledge also described the ship. We went inside the big spaceship, also into a triangular one. The major conclusions of the exploration were it was a mothership, very old, that crossed the universe at least a billion years ago. Understandably, due to the sensational nature of the videos, Rutledge's posts to YouTube gathered millions of hits. But soon after, he claims his account was hacked and the videos deleted. Was NASA trying to destroy the evidence of these most secretive missions? If so, it didn't work. Quickly, Rutledge and others would set up multiple mirrored versions of the videos on several different video-sharing websites, and they remain widely available today. But did NASA, or anyone, really need to worry? For many, the story was simply too incredible to be believed. Indeed, more than one commentator noted how similar Rutledge's claims were to a variety of science fiction films. Could there be any truth in the Apollo 20 story. Photographs of the lunar surface taken by Apollo 15 in 1971 do appear to show some strange anomalies in the Del Portalzac region and the southern region of the Moon's dark side. An unusual cigar-shaped object situated on the edge of a crater can clearly be seen in several of the NASA photographs circulating on the Internet, 
including those on NASA's very own website. The feature looks to have mass and form and seems to sit on top of the Moon's surface rather than be a part of it. The videos of the supposed Apollo 20 flyover of the craft show it to be stone-like in texture but covered in intricate carvings and patterns that could not possibly be natural. If the footage is a hoax, then the creators have avoided the obvious temptation to make their spaceship metallic and futuristic-looking, instead opting for a curious megalithic design replete with elaborate decoration. Rutledge's account of the Apollo 20 mission and his video footage have been met with widespread skepticism. But if they are a hoax, he has managed to insert some authentic details into his story that give it some hint of authenticity. Whilst Rutledge and Leona Marietta Snyder appear in no official lists of NASA or Soviet astronauts, Alexei Leonov was an internationally respected Soviet cosmonaut, best known for becoming the first man to walk in space in 1965. For hoaxers to include such a high-profile figure as Leonov was risky, as he could simply have come out with unassailable proof that he was elsewhere at the time of the mission and the whole deception would instantly fall apart. Was this bold choice of using a real cosmonaut actually evidence for Apollo 20's authenticity? One figure shown briefly in the videos even looks like Leonov, which at least attests to an attention to detail. Other aspects of the footage show that, if a hoax, the creators had access to either real Apollo mission hardware or a very good replica of it. Several shots in the videos showing the interior of the lunar module are exact and impressive replicas of the real thing. An Apollo 20 badge, complete with the names of the three astronauts, is also visible in some frames as further proof this is not simply recycled footage from one of the earlier official Apollo missions. If Rutledge was really an imposter, then this part of the video was well produced. He must have had a decent-sized budget to replicate a whole Apollo module interior inside a studio, indicating this was a professional operation. Alternatively, he may have somehow secured access to a real Apollo lunar module housed in a museum, although it seems unlikely any museum would ever consent to the filming of a hoax video in such a location. Was the real reason Rutledge's depiction of the module's interior so accurate because it was genuinely filmed aboard a secret Apollo 20 mission to the moon? There are numerous examples of researchers and investigators discovering anomalous artifacts and structures in NASA photographs, both of the moon and other planets in the solar system. Author and lecturer Richard C. Hoagland is a proponent of many such claims most famously that of the Face on Mars, a striking formation in the Cydonia region of the planet's surface that Hoagland still insists is a giant alien statue of a human-like face. Like many such observations, Hoagland's work is based on poor-quality, blurry photos, often nth-generation copies found on the Internet. Invariably, when higher-quality source images are found, Many of these seemingly artificial structures prove to just be optical illusions, and that proved to be the case when newer, far higher resolution images gathered by probes such as NASA's Mars Global Surveyor in 2003 showed the Cydonia face was merely a hill, an entirely natural structure that only vaguely resembled a face when illuminated at the right angle. Hoogland's work is an example of a psychological phenomenon called pareidolia, the tendency of the human mind to perceive significant patterns where there are none. Often this takes the form of seeing human faces or animals in abstract or formless images. William Rutledge's story of Apollo 20 begins with the premise that Apollo 15 captured images of a giant, cigar-shaped mothership on the dark side of the moon. Many of the images circling on the Internet today do show what appears to be an artificial object, but they are low resolution and lack detail. Like the face on Mars, when higher quality source images are referenced, this mothership is shown to be an optical illusion. The structure is merely a long hill on the lunar surface, 
which, when in deep shadow, appears to resemble a cylindrical object. With Rutledge's alien spacecraft vanished into the dust, much of his story disappears with it. How could the crew of Apollo 20 have explored a spaceship that does not exist? Showing that the spacecraft in the photographs is simply a hill does not prove Apollo 20 never flew, but if it did, its mission as stated by Rutledge is a deception. Could the spacecraft story be deliberate misinformation to hide Apollo 20's real mission in a cloak of absurd-sounding science fiction? Or did the apocryphal mission never even get off the ground? The American's mammoth Saturn V rocket remains the only vehicle ever developed that was capable of taking a payload further than low Earth orbit. As such, all of the Apollo moon missions were launched using those rockets. Between 1966 and 1973, 13 of the rockets were successfully launched from the Kennedy Space Center, 12 of them for Apollo and one for Skylab. A further two were constructed but never used and are now on display in museums and space centers across America. This presents a serious problem for William Rutledge's story about a secret Apollo 20 mission. Since the Saturn V was the only rocket capable of propelling a payload beyond Earth orbit, and since all of the known Saturn V rockets are accounted for, how did Apollo 20 even leave the Earth? In order for the Apollo 20 mission to have occurred, we have to propose either the USA had built more Saturn V rockets in secret or that they or the Soviet Union had developed other completely unknown rocket technologies that were capable of sending men to the moon. Construction of the Saturn V was a massive effort involving tens of thousands of engineers, designers, scientists, and contractors all around the world. The rocket was also vastly expensive. Each one cost over $3 billion, so expensive that the cost was one of the main reasons the Apollo program was canceled by President Nixon. After construction, the next challenge was the logistics of storing and transporting something so huge. Special buildings and vehicles had to be designed, and the moving of the rocket to the launch site involved thousands of people. Even if it was possible to keep all of this completely secret, the real problem would be the launch itself. According to Rutledge, Apollo 20 was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base, an installation that's located close to several large towns and cities in Santa Barbara. There's even a public rail line that runs right alongside the base. The launch of any rocket, let alone something as huge as a Saturn V, would be visible for hundreds of miles around, unmissable to hundreds of thousands of people throughout Southern California. Civil aviation and air traffic control would have to be notified, as would numerous other public bodies. It would essentially be impossible for a secret launch to have occurred from Vanderburg, all but confirming the Apollo 20 story is a hoax a confirmation that would soon come from the hoaxer himself. French sculptor Thierry Speth claimed responsibility for the Apollo 20 hoax on an internet bulletin board in 2007. Speth's use of the username RetiredAFB elsewhere on the internet was also exposed by several researchers. Although Speth admitted the videos were a hoax, this has not deterred posters on websites and internet forums propagating the videos as genuine either unaware of Speth's admission or choosing to ignore it. One line of reasoning has it that Speth's confession is itself a hoax, simply an attempt at damage limitation or misinformation from NASA. But a closer look at the videos Speth posted under the pseudonym of William Rutledge show the clear fingerprints of fakery. Since the hoaxers were obviously unable to produce their own footage of the moon, they had no alternative but to use existing NASA photos of the lunar surface in order to create their footage, a fact which makes the task of producing undetectable fakes virtually impossible. Several of the shots of the moon's surface used in the videos are unmistakably composites, using such NASA photographs with fictional elements added by the hoaxers. One of the film's most striking sequences was created in this way. The panning shot showing what appears to be a vast alien city on the lunar surface 
is actually a digital composite created from an Apollo 17 moon photo combined with a painting of alien landscape by artist Bruce Pennington. The next sequence in the videos, showing the alien mothership, look very much like they were filmed using models, with the wobbly-looking flyover of the craft being perhaps the least convincing part of the whole film. Theory Speth is a sculptor by trade, and he appears to have put his talents to good use in creating the Mona Lisa alien body as well. Indeed, several of the artworks shown on his website have a strong resemblance to the body seen in the videos. As beguiling as she seems, Mona Lisa is, in all likelihood, a clay sculpture created by Speth as the centerpiece of his hoax. She bears all the hallmarks of the artist's previous works and, whilst very artfully designed, does not convince as a real body in most of the shots in the video. The cavalier attitude toward the alien body is also a giveaway as to its unreality. No quarantine protocols are evident, and the unqualified astronauts perform crude medical procedures on the alien that clearly would never have been allowed in a real NASA mission. There's no doubt that the tale of Apollo 20 and its secret mission to investigate aliens on the moon is a fantastic story. We all want it to be true, which might explain why basic critical faculties are often suspended when the story is recounted on the Internet. Those who want to believe will find a way to keep Apollo 20's incredible adventure to the dark side of the moon alive, regardless of the facts. As alternative history, it is more captivating than mere reality. Up next, one of the most well-known explorers, Christopher Columbus, had a signature that was so perplexing that most scholars believe it a secret code of some kind, and so far an unbreakable code. And some victims died because they happened to leave their doors unlocked. Other victims had been methodically stalked, how do serial killers choose their victims? We'll look at the methods of nine of the most notorious serial killers in history. Those stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm a 19-year-old girl from the west of Scotland. Myself and my family have always had connections with ghosts and spirits and talk openly about them, so it's quite normal for us. I live in an old miner's cottage which was built in the 1800s, and before I lived there, my uncle and cousins did. One day I watched my cousin as she sat at the bottom of the stairs looking up. I asked what she was looking at, and she just replied with, "'The man on the stairs.'" A few years later, I moved in with my mom and, sure enough, every night I could hear distinct, heavy footsteps walking up and down the stairs. He seems to be pretty chill, and I've never felt threatened in the house with him. He's affectionately named the man on the stairs. Another time I was having trouble in my own room with a spirit and would wake up with things thrown on me and my belongings moved. 
I wasn't able to sleep in my own room for about a month until I finally went to my parish priest, who agreed to come and bless my house for me, and the trouble died down then. But every now and then, I begin to feel very uneasy in my room. I'm not sure if I should get it blessed again, as I definitely do not want it to get as bad as it was before. I can happily sit in the presence of ghosts, as long as we both go about our own business and I don't feel threatened. Serial killers frequently follow a pattern. That pattern may just be the ways in which they harm their victims, but frequently their patterns extend to the manner in which they choose their victims as well. Some killers target people who look similar or have the same jobs or the same interests. These nine killers all had specific profiles they bore in mind while choosing their next victims. Adam Leroy Lane Lane reportedly hated women, saying they were below him. He's known to have killed two women and was caught while trying to kill a third, a 15-year-old girl. Police believe he may have killed many more as he traveled for his job as a trucker. He put little planning into his attacks. His first known victim was killed while she was outside in her yard talking on the phone. He chose his second victim by trying doors. Monica Massaro was stabbed to death in her New Jersey home because her door was unlocked. Lane's only goal was to kill women. He didn't particularly care what they did or looked like. Robert Hansen Hansen was an experienced tracker and hunter. He literally hunted his female victims. He either drove or flew them in his private plane to remote sections of Alaska, then released them to pursue them through the woods. He kidnapped, raped, and murdered at least 17 women around Anchorage and possibly more than 30. Hansen had a stutter and bad acne growing up. He reportedly felt shunned by attractive girls in his school and turned his revenge fantasies into reality. Hansen primarily targeted good-looking women who worked in the sex trade. Dennis Rader Rader, the BTK, bind, torture, kill killer, shows his victims carefully. He identified women who fit his specific sexual fantasies, then stalked them over a period of time. He left a frightening note for one intended victim who didn't come home the night he planned to kill her. It read, Be glad you weren't here, because I was. Raider prioritized targets who lived alone or didn't lock their doors regularly. Anders Breivik this Norwegian mass murderer killed 77 people, first detonating a bomb at a government building, then shooting dozens of people trapped on an island summer camp. Most were the children of liberal Norwegian politicians. Breivik, a neo-Nazi, says he planned the terrorist attack for nine years. His manifesto, published the day of the attack, declared his enemies were feminism, Islam, and cultural Marxism. Richard Chase. Sometimes called the Vampire of Sacramento, he told police that he chose only victims whose doors were unlocked. He said he considered an unlocked door a sign that his victim wanted him to enter. Chase killed at least six people, drank their blood, and sometimes ate their flesh. Ashley Mervyn Colson Australian killer Coulson picked two victims after they put an ad in the paper. Two students were looking for a third person to share their house. Colton answered the ad and forced the two women into separate rooms. The brother-in-law of one of the women was there at the time and Coulson forced him into a third room. All three were hogtied and shot. No motive has ever been established. Coulson went on to attempt to abduct another couple about a month later but was stopped by nearby security guards. Colin Ireland Ireland stalked his victims in gay bars, 
choosing men who were willing to be tied up as part of a sexual game. Ireland claimed he was not gay and his motivation was not sexual. Rather, he said it was easier to kill someone when they willingly allowed themselves to be restrained. Ireland killed at least five men and died in prison. Gary Ridgway The so-called Green River Killer targeted vulnerable women, prostitutes and runaways. That may have been why he was able to kill so many before being caught. He was convicted of 49 murders but is believed to have killed twice that number. He himself said he killed so many women that he has trouble keeping them straight. Anthony Sowell When he was arrested, police found 11 bodies in Sowell's Cleveland, Ohio duplex. Sowell, too, chose victims he believed were less likely to be missed. In this case, the killer chose African-American women, typically ones who were not close with their families or struggled with drug use, thinking that police and the community would not be able to come together to find the victims. And he was right. Many of his victims had not even been reported missing by their families. One of the most well-known explorers but least talked about unsolved codes is the signature of Christopher Columbus. It might be surprising that, to this day, no one is completely sure on its meaning. The cause for this is because Columbus never explained his reasoning for adopting the mysterious writings of his signet. What is known, however, is that it was very important to him. Columbus began using the mysterious signet after returning from his first voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. The first known example dates to 1483, and historians have numerous other examples and documents demonstrating the curious signature from that time on to his death. He even instructed his heirs to continue using the signet themselves. In doing so, we have a written record for how Columbus described his signature. He directed them to sign with my signature, which I now employ, which is an X with an S over it and an M with a Roman A over it, and over that an S, and then a Greek Y with an S over it, preserving the relation of the lines and points. If you could see an illustration, the shape is actually the form of a triangle, and by his instructions this was exactly how it should be written, without alteration. Attempts to decode the signature have, of course, been made and many theories put forth. They range from stating his signature proves he was secretly a Jew in search of a new land for his persecuted people to being a devout Catholic. One of the most commonly accepted suggestions are that the letters S, SAS, XMY, Expoferens decode to, translated, Servant, I am of the Most Exalted Savior, Christ Mary and Joseph, Christ Bearer. The last part of his signature, Expoferens, is agreed by most to be a Greek-Latin form for his name Christopher. Expo, a Greek form for Christo, and Ferens is a Latin form. This combination, however, allows for a deeper religious significance to appear in his name. When translated, it can literally mean Christ Bearer. But there are other theories. Some suggest the shape he chose for his signet is important and feel it could mimic the mast of a ship and a Jewish prayer, supporting ideas that Columbus himself was Jewish and looking for a new homeland for his Jewish people. By signing his name as such, he was secretly conveying this to other hidden Jews. Some also found his signet to support the Crusades and his desire to free the Holy Land of Muslims. The example given is that his signature can refer to, May the Saracens be subjugated, turned away and removed by Christ Mary Joseph. It's difficult to know for certain, though. While many do feel his signature is religious in nature and that the X, M, Y do connect to Christus, Maria, Josephus, or Christ, Mary and Joseph, some put forth the why might perhaps refer to Isabel, or Queen Isabella who backed his most famous voyage. Unless a document is found, 
revealing Christopher Columbus's intentions, it seems the mystery of his signature will continue on. When Weird Darkness returns, it has been 12 years since Jennifer Keese disappeared from her Florida home without a trace. What happened to her? We'll look inside this case that is still a mystery. And in 1894, a massive fire broke out in the forests of Minnesota, killing more than 400 people. Do their ghosts remain behind with the ashes? These stories are up next. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. On September 1, 1894, a massive fire broke out in the forests of Minnesota, destroying more than 390 square miles of land and the town of Hinckley. The official death count was 418, although it was likely even higher than that. Many of those who died were simply never found. It was a hot summer in Minnesota in 1894 with high temperatures, a two-month-long drought, and then common method of lumber harvesting in place, which stripped branches in place and littered the ground with flammable debris, a terrible fire was simply a matter of time. The deadly combination began with several small fires in Pine County, Minnesota that united into a firestorm. As the heat, smoke, and gases from these smaller fires rose into the sky, they were pushed back down by cooler air above. As the heat came down, it swirled into a tornado of flames, which then began to move quickly and grew larger and larger, turning into a horrific firestorm. The fire first destroyed the towns of Mission Creek and Brook Park before coming into the town of Hinckley. The temperature rose to at least 2,000 degrees, melting barrels of nails into a solid mass and fused cars on the Eastern Minnesota Railroad Yard to the tracks. Some residents escaped by climbing into wells, ponds, or the Grindstone River. Others made it aboard the two crowded trains that managed to pull out of Hinckley before it was consumed by flames. James Root, an engineer on a train heading south from Duluth, rescued nearly 300 people by backing up a train nearly five miles to Skunk Lake where the passengers escaped the fire. William Best was an engineer on the second train, and he steamed to Hinckley to try and save as many people as possible. When the smoke finally cleared, Hinckley was in ruins. It had also destroyed the nearby settlements of Mission Creek, Brook Park, Sandstone, Miller, Partridge, and Pokagama. Hundreds of acres of land lay black and smoldering and hundreds had been killed. Could this be why ghost stories still linger in Hinckley? In the small town was a gravel pit where many residents were unable to make it to the trains and they took refuge from the fire. The pit had been dug by the railroad and had filled with water from a natural spring. After the summer drought, though, the water was only about three feet deep. Many considered it an eyesore but it ended up saving the lives of more than 100 people, livestock, and wild animals during the fire. Everyone who took refuge there survived, 
except for one man who fainted and was stepped on by a cow and died. Fire victims waded out the blaze in the pit, emerging to find their town was in ashes. The pit was eventually filled in and became part of a public park, but despite the lack of death connected to it, it has come to be considered a haunted place. They say that if you are a believer in ghosts, the town of Hinkley will offer many opportunities to find them. At the site of the old gravel pit, strange lights at night and, as one resident stated, sometimes there are more dead people in the streets of Hinkley than live ones. On the evening of January 24, 2006, friends and family of 24-year-old Floridian Jennifer Keys had already begun to pass out flyers requesting information on the whereabouts of the young woman who had vanished either late the night before or early that morning. By the following day, news of her disappearance had spread beyond Orlando and into national news outlets. Before she vanished, Jennifer Keese seemed to have it all – a loving family and boyfriend, a great job, and no reason for her to drop everything and run away. Her loved ones naturally assumed that something terrible must have happened. That remains the prevailing assumption today, but more than a decade later, detectives still have not made much headway in the case. There is some haunting, grady video footage of a person of interest and authorities have found Kesey's abandoned car, but there is overall minimal physical evidence for law enforcement to work with. So what exactly happened to Jennifer Keese in 2006? Jennifer Keese was 24 at the time of her disappearance and by all accounts was a successful young woman. She had a stable job working as a finance manager for Central Florida Investments timeshare company in Ocoee, Florida, and was the proud new owner of a condo in nearby Orlando. Keese and her boyfriend, Robert Allen, had recently vacationed in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Life appeared pleasant. Then came the morning of January 24th. Keese had returned home from work around 6 p.m. the night prior and chatted with her family on the phone. She called her boyfriend later that night at around 10 p.m. before turning in for bed. Robert Allen would be the last person in Keese's inner circle to have connected with her. It was common for Keese to call or send a text message to her boyfriend as she was leaving for work, but no message came on the morning of January 24th. Concerned, Allen made several attempts to contact his girlfriend, but texts went unreceived and phone calls went straight to voicemail. Co-workers had also begun to wonder why they hadn't heard from Keese. It was unlike her to not call in, and she had missed an important morning meeting. At 11 a.m., Jennifer Keese's employer contacted her parents to inform them of the situation. Realizing that something was amiss with their daughter, Drew and Joyce Keese made the drive down from Tampa to Orlando to check that their daughter was at her home. They soon discovered that her car was missing, but that her condo did not show any signs of disarray. They found a damp towel, puddles in the shower suggesting she washed before work that morning a pair of pajamas on the floor, and some makeup on the counter. Her mother noted in the podcast Unconcluded, which details the investigation, that a particular pair of pumps that Keese was excited about was missing from her closet that morning. All of this evidence seemed to indicate that Keese had left for work, as usual. It should be noted, however, that the Orlando police never processed Keese's condo as a crime scene. So where was she? In the years following Jennifer Keese's disappearance, police had managed to track down her car, but not much else. Two days after Keese disappeared, police received a phone call from somebody who had seen a photo of her car on the news and thought that it looked a lot like the one parked outside their apartment complex. It was indeed the car in question, a black 2004 Chevy Malibu. Upon analyzing the car at the police crime lab, just two pieces of physical evidence were recovered. A latent print deemed too minuscule to yield any helpful information and a small amount of DNA. A DVD player of hers remained in the backseat of the car, 
and because Keese's personal effects like her cell phone and purse had never been located, it can be surmised that the motive of the suspect was not robbery. While the lack of physical evidence from the car was frustrating, the video footage captured from the apartment complex was just as disappointing for detectives. The surveillance video showed a person of interest dropping off the car at noon on the day of the disappearance, but any physical description of the suspect is almost entirely obscured by the apartment's gate. The cameras were designed to capture images just once every three seconds, as opposed to continuously, and it just so happened that at each interval the person of interest was obscured by a different gatepost while walking by. Investigators went so far as to tap NASA to enhance the video footage of the person but have been unable to determine whether that person was even a man or a woman. Police could only discern that the person was between 5'3 and 5'5. Journalists who covered the story reported that the obscured footage made this person of interest the luckiest person of interest ever. Without much physical evidence to go on, the investigation turned to those who knew Jennifer Keese. Her boyfriend and brother both checked out and an ex-boyfriend who had wanted to rekindle their relationship was also ruled out. Detectives learned that an older work colleague had unsuccessfully pursued a romantic relationship, but he too was determined unsuspicious. Keese had mentioned to her family that construction workers doing renovations at her complex would occasionally catcall, but those leads also turned up nothing. Her credit cards went unused after her disappearance, and her cell phone had been turned off. The beloved daughter of the Keese family was nowhere to be found, and there were no clues to go on. Imagine waking up and your daughter is nowhere to be found, Orlando police detective Teresa Sprague told the Orlando Sentinel on the 10th anniversary of the disappearance. You can't reach her. You can't locate her. The police can't locate her. Hours turn into panic and days into your worst nightmare. I cannot imagine the nightmare the Keese family had been sleepwalking through for the last 10 years. As of late, the Keese family has been largely disappointed in the Orlando police investigation, stating that they have largely withheld information from the family. They add that outside of a two-page document, the police have had little contact with the family regarding their progression of the case. We need to get this information. Keese's father reported to Fox News, after 12 years, we deserve that. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact Crime Line Florida. You can find a link to them in the show notes. Ground zero for rumors of witchcraft in Spain can be traced to the construction of the castle of Trasmos sometime in the 13th century. The layout of the spooky and imposing structure was a unique hexagonal shape, which was seen as a sure sign of witchcraft afoot, and it did not help that the castle supposedly constantly issued forth anomalous noises such as rattling chains, the banging of metal which was seen as the result of witches mixing potions in their cauldrons, and other mischief, as well as occasional shrieks and arcane wails. Even the construction of the castle was wreathed in myth, as it was said to have been created in a single night by a magician called Mutamin. Many of these bizarre rumors seem to have been originally intentionally spread by the castle's very own inhabitants. At the time, the castle of Trasmas was said to be a major den of the illicit manufacture of fake coins, which was helped along by the rich silver and iron mines of the area. It is said that in order to keep the locals from becoming too nosy about all the noise they were making, the counterfeiters intentionally began to fan out rumors that the scraping and banging of metal was from the nefarious activities of witches engaged in their dark, arcane business and the ploy worked, and it is thought that this was where the village's reputation as a haven of witches began. Unfortunately for the villagers, the rumors spread by the fake coin forgers worked a little too well. Before long, the rumor grew to encompass the whole village until it was seen as a veritable hive of witches and warlocks, a cursed place 
and a center of the dark arts that stirred fear and superstition in the surrounding areas, an idea still held on to by many today. It got to the point that the neighboring monastery of Veruela had the entire village officially excommunicated from the church, although this is often seen as just being an excuse to force Trasmas to pay taxes to them, something from which they had previously been exempt, as it didn't officially belong to the Catholic Church. With the excommunication carried out and in full effect, the villagers nevertheless refused to beg for forgiveness, with many of them Jews and Muslims, and not even Christian, which only furthered their reputation as devil-worshipping heathens. The friction between Trasmas and Veruela Abbey would continue for many years, eventually almost leading to civil war when the abbey began trying to divert the village's irrigation water without paying. Although the King of Spain, King Ferdinand II, deemed Trasmas to be in the right in terms of the water dispute and ruled in their favor, the church took this as an affront. Seething that they had been bested by this witch-infested, excommunicated town, the Catholic Church went about getting revenge. Pope Julius II gave permission to dust off the powerful and rarely used Catholic curse, Psalm 108 of the Book of Psalms, which is said to be a potent curse saved for the worst of times, and in this case it was invoked to curse the entire village of Trasmos. Psalm 108 reads as thus, a song, a psalm of David. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Save us and help us with your right hand, that those you love may be delivered. God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my washbasin, on Edom I toss my sandal, over Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? It is not you, God, you have rejected us and no longer go out with our armies. Give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Why this somehow was seen as a curse is beyond me. It was in the wake of this wicked curse that the once prosperous and populous village fell into severe decline, suffering from a mysterious epidemic of disease, famine, a fire which burned down the castle of Trasmos in 1520, and other myriad woes, during which time the population fell to its current low. Even to this day the village is poor and in shambles, its buildings weathered and decrepit, its nearly empty streets cracked and weed-choked, a veritable ghost town, and for many this is a result of the Catholic curse which is technically still in effect, as no pope has ever officially lifted it. This makes Trasmas the only entire town in all of Spain to remain both excommunicated and also cursed by the Catholic Church, as well as to incidentally still be considered a haven for witches and witchcraft. This reputation has brought in droves of tourists to this tiny, withered village who come for the dark history and to see for themselves what an officially cursed town of witches looks like. Trasmos does little to downplay this history of witchcraft, and indeed there is the yearly festival held there, during which amulets, potions, herbs, charms, and other magical witches' items are sold, and there is even the crowning of the Witch of the Year. There is a museum of witchcraft now located in the castle of Trasmos, where the whole legend started. If one is ever to visit, there are plenty of charms to be bought against witchcraft. So rest assured, you're in safe hands. Up next, Jeffrey Dampier won the lottery, was generous with it to everyone he knew, 
but it didn't stop him from being murdered by a family member. They found Annie stretched out on the floor with a pistol lying by her hand, with no sign of struggle and nothing had been taken. So why is there a question whether she actually committed suicide? But first up, the incredible true story of Betty and Barney Hill, who claim to have had a close encounter of the fourth kind, and even have evidence to back it up. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love the Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The idea of little green men from Mars invading our planet has been bringing us excitement, joy, and even laughter for decades, simply due to the absurdness of the image. But on September 19, 1961, a reported event occurred on the back roads of New Hampshire that single-handedly rewrote what experts believed about UFO encounters and little green men. Up until this time, only a handful of reports of a similar nature had surfaced. However, this was the first highly publicized abduction account filled with detailed information. What happened close to Lancaster that evening made international headlines and made celebrities out of the couple that came forward. Their names were Betty and Barney Hill, and this is their story. The Hills were a married couple living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire with their pet dog, Delcy. Betty was a social worker with the State Welfare Agency, and Barney worked for the post office. They were respected members of their community as members of the NAACP and the Unitarian Church. In fact, the governor had appointed Barney to serve on the state civil rights committee. After a short vacation to Niagara Falls, they were driving home on Highway 3 through the White Mountains. Betty sat in the passenger seat and was idly gazing out the window when she noticed a bright light that she initially thought was a star. It seemed to be following them, but it was moving erratically. The couple had a brief conversation about it. Barney initially assumed that it was just an ordinary aircraft, but Betty suggested they pull over so they could get a better look and also to give Delcy a pit stop. Barney stopped the car and got out his binoculars. Betty looked first. She knew it wasn't a star when she saw a spinning craft with an odd shape and flashing lights of different colors. Barney took his turn to look through the binoculars. Although he had presumed it must be an airplane, he saw it rapidly descend and move in their direction, too quickly to be a plane. He rushed back into the car and continued to drive toward Franconia Notch. Betty watched the craft as it got closer and closer until it was right over them, forcing them to stop in the road. Barney did not know what they were looking at, but it was huge and silent. It hovered about 100 feet above them. He grabbed his pistol and the binoculars and went out to investigate. Barney saw windows across a pancake-shaped object. As he moved toward it, he saw something else that made him turn and run back to the car. Inside the craft, there were up to 11 beings that didn't quite look human. They were staring at him through the windows. Barney hysterically ran back to the car and drove away as fast as he could, but the hills were suddenly overcome by buzzing and tingling throughout their bodies. 
this was when things became very cloudy for them. When they regained full consciousness, they were once again experiencing the tingling, and they were 35 miles further down the road, without any memory of the drive to get there. When the Hills arrived home around dawn, they both felt strange. They knew they had seen something, but they couldn't remember what had happened after they felt the buzzing sensations. Both Betty and Barney had physical changes from the night before, including Betty's torn and stained dress, Barney's scraped shoe, and a broken binocular strap. But neither of them had any memory of these things having happened. Each also owned a watch, and after the previous night's events, neither watch ever worked again. Attention quickly turned to the car. On the back of the vehicle, shiny circles of concentric nature were discovered. A compass placed near the circles indicated that the circles were somehow magnetized. Betty confided in her sister, who strongly advised that she get in touch with the local Air Force base to report the incident. Barney was more concerned with being labeled an eccentric, but allowed Betty to get in touch with Peace AFB on September 21st. At that time, she made her first report. Five days later, Major Paul Henderson visited the Hills at their home and completed an official inquiry. A report written by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, or NICAP, concluded that the Air Force files had insufficient data on the events of that night. Ten days after their encounter, Betty began to have vivid dreams about the strange event. Five nights in a row, her dreams contained small men in uniforms who forced the hills into a strange craft and subjected them to examinations. She wrote down her dreams in a journal. Betty went to the library and found a book on the UFO phenomenon written by former Marine Corps Major Donald Kehoe, leader of NICAP. She contacted him directly, and their investigation began about a month after the sighting. Both of the Hills were interviewed at length by NICAP officials. Betty and Barney both admitted to seeing the same thing, a large disc that was silent. The people that Barney said he saw were somehow not human. The couple did try and put the whole episode behind them, but were being affected in different ways. Barney grew more and more stressed and anxious as time went on. Outsiders assumed that this was due to their interracial marriage, an uncommon occurrence during that generation. Some criticized the couple based solely on their union. None of this helped either spouse, and things got so bad for Barney that he was forced to take time off work in order to try and recover. Things were not much better for Betty, but she turned her attention toward trying to find out as much as she could about their perceived encounter. Meanwhile, Barney began seeing a therapist. Their feelings that something happened that they couldn't quite piece together gnawed at them for two years. A speaker at the Hills Church, Ben H. Sweat, gave a talk about his poetry and Betty and Barney attended. The pastor was aware that Ben dabbled in hypnotherapy and asked him about it. At the end of the talk, Betty and Barney asked Ben if he thought hypnotherapy might be able to help regain what they felt were lost memories. They also asked for his help, but he declined because he didn't feel that he was qualified, and instead he recommended they ask Barney's therapist for a referral. They took his advice, and that is when they found Dr. Simon. Dr. Benjamin Simon began working with the couple at the start of 1964. Over the course of around six months, he used hypnotic regression during the first sessions, Dr. Simon concluded by inducing amnesia to each partner in order to reduce the possibility of potential collusion out of session. If neither was able to remember what happened, then there was less chance of them discussing matters among themselves. In his sessions, Barney had many new recollections, such as meeting an Irishman that had red hair. There were also beings there that didn't seem to be human all of these individuals were dressed in similar-looking uniforms. Each had a peaked cap and silver piping on the uniform itself that reminded Barney of Nazi uniforms. 
According to his own memories during hypnosis, Barney said the crew spoke a language he could not understand and also English, but they weren't using their mouths. Barney said they appeared to use thought transference. Betty reported similar events during her hypnotic sessions separately from her husband. Both revealed that they underwent medical exams during which the beings took numerous samples that included blood, bodily fluids, and hair. Betty also stated that as part of her exam, skin samples were taken. Much of what Betty had mentioned during her sessions were things that had already been written in her journal. Something took place on board the craft that only Betty noted, though. She indicated that the aliens showed her a map of where they came from, which she drew during one of her sessions. Some people believed this could be the location of their home world. Additionally, Betty had indicated that the beings showed her trade routes that they used frequently, routes they did not take often and those they took for expeditions. Sometime around 1970, a teacher from Ohio made a match to the Zeta Reticuli star system. It looked just like the map Betty drew and also included our own sun. Some of the stars on that map were not cataloged until after the Betty and Barney Hill incident, which for some people proves that their experience was genuine. Carl Sagan, however, provided another perspective on his show Cosmos, Episode 12. He said there is a resemblance between the two maps, but that's mainly because the lines corresponding to the navigation route have been copied from the hill map onto the real star map. If we were to substitute some other set of lines for the hill lines, we find that the eye suddenly is biased against seeing any agreement between the two maps at all. He also indicated that anyone can find just about any pattern from various vantage points in space. Once Dr. Simon completed the hypnotic sessions, he presented the tapes to the local NICAP investigators. Having interviewed the pair shortly after the original event, NICAP officials were impressed by their honesty and intelligence. Both wanted nothing more than to get to the bottom of what happened to them. Many people considered the Hills to be reliable, and even Dr. Simon believed that the Hills truly and sincerely believed what they reported. On the other hand, Dr. Simon never believed in UFOs or alien visitations. He was under the impression that the Hills shared a delusion based on Betty's dreams. Although he conducted the hypnosis sessions, he never swayed them into their testimonies. On the contrary, Ben Sweat heard the session tapes and indicated that Dr. Simon actually tried to suggest logical, rational explanations for the Hills' memories during the sessions, but to no avail they stuck with their abduction stories. Toward the end of 1965, the Boston Herald Traveler managed to get an exclusive scoop when they somehow acquired reports of the original encounter. Someone had broken confidence, and October 25th was the first of a five-day expose of the Betty and Barney Hill alien abduction story. According to Sweat, Barney was upset about the leak and he had called Sweat in the middle of the night in a panic about it. Barney said he and Betty were afraid that they would be scorned and ridiculed and lose their jobs, said Sweat in his personal statement about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case. Now that the couple was a media sensation, they both felt they had little choice. They needed to break their own silence. Before this, neither made any overtures for publicity at all, The Hills and Dr. Simon all collaborated with author John Fuller to produce a book based on their experience. This book, titled The Interrupted Journey, emerged in 1966. Betty's niece, Kathleen Martin, wrote a second book entitled it Captured, The Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Both publications are still available today, along with countless others. We may never know what really happened to Betty and Barney Hill on September 19, 1961. The public is divided in its perception of the story between those who believe it wholeheartedly and those who think the story was merely a confabulation. What is certain is that despite their reluctance to come forward and report their encounter, the Hills have become synonymous with the UFO community. 
their experience turned into the most well-known of all UFO reports and would set the stage for many others like it. As the 1960s progressed, Barney's health began to worsen. In February 1969, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Betty never remarried after his death and went on to become something of a UFO celebrity until her own death in 2004. John Dorman left the farmhouse to work in his fields at about 1.15 the afternoon of September 1, 1897. His wife Lizzie had some banking to take care of and left for Philadelphia at about 2. As usual, they left their children in the care of John's half-sister Annie. 18-year-old Annie Dorman had lived with John and his wife at their Cobbs Creek home off and on for the previous five years, working as a nurse to their four children. Around 3 p.m. that day, a neighbor, Mrs. Myers, came by to chat with Annie, leaving about 10 minutes later. At 4.30, one of the children found Annie lying on the floor of the second-story room, dead from a gunshot wound. The children ran for their father, who returned to the house with Al Myers, stable boss at nearby Melbourne Mills. They found Annie stretched out on the floor with a pistol lying by her hand. There was no sign of a struggle and nothing had been taken. The men could only conclude that Annie had taken her own life. But suicide was unlikely for a number of reasons. No one who knew Annie could imagine what would have driven her to kill herself. She was bright and pretty, with an even and sweet temperament, and was always cheerful. Her boyfriend, Ernest L. Pendlebury, was steady and honest. She was a religious girl, healthy in mind and body, a favorite among the congregation of Sarah D. Cooper Methodist Church. The circumstance of Annie's death made suicide all but impossible. The pistol was old and rusty, sitting unused for at least two years, high on a shelf in the room where she was found. Annie was only five feet tall and would not be able to reach the pistol without standing on something, and none of the furniture had been moved. Chief Barry of the Chester Police Department examined the pistol and found it so rusty that it took all his might to cock it and pull the trigger. It had been fired five times. Two shots went through the ceiling, one went through a washerboard under a window, one shot shattered Annie's jaw, and one shot went through her heart. The shot through the heart had killed her, but the shot to the jaw had been so severe that she would not have been able to fire another. Since nothing had been stolen, it was thought that Annie may have been raped. When the body was found, her dress had been smoothed, as if to hide signs of a struggle, but the top had been opened, exposing her breasts. The medical examiner determined that Annie had not been raped and was still a virgin. The inquest held at the Dorman homestead on October 5th reveal that the household had not been as peaceful as it first appeared. A letter from Annie's father said that John's wife had not treated her right. One witness said that he had seen Annie crying on several occasions and had seen Mrs. Dorman chase her with a broom. Lizzie Dorman admitted that once during a quarrel with Annie she had grabbed her by the throat, but generally their relations had been pleasant. Their disagreements were seen as trivial, hardly provoking murder, and Mrs. Dorman was in the city at the time of the shooting. The coroner's jury ruled that Annie Dorman was shot by a person or persons unknown. The Philadelphia Inquirer speculated that a man who knew Annie and was familiar with the place had been watching and knew when she was alone. He entered the house between 3.30 and 4 and approached Annie with one intention. She at once detected the foulness of that intention. She pleaded with him, then threatened him. It was someone she knew, and he realized he had gone too far and must silence her. He reached for the gun, and she rushed him, fighting for her honor and her life. Three shots were fired wildly before the two that killed her. The murderer then placed the gun by her side and smoothed down her dress to hide evidence of a struggle, but like all takers of life, left the one mute piece of evidence in the shape of the exposed bosom. But there was no way to prove any of this, 
and no way to determine the identity of the man or even whether the killer was a man. With no leads to follow and no funds available to hire professional detectives, Delaware County District Attorney W. I. Schaefer was forced to drop the investigation. The circumstances of Annie Dorman's murder still remain a mystery. If you're like most people, you've probably fantasized at least once about winning the lottery. After all, with that kind of money, you'd never need to deal with going to work. You'd never have to worry about bills or saving for retirement. But to paraphrase Biggie Smalls, sometimes more money just means more problems. And that's especially true for people who win the lottery. It turns out that becoming a multimillionaire overnight doesn't always lead to happiness. Just ask Jeffrey Dampier. Jeffrey Dampier was an average guy. He grew up on Chicago's west side and worked as a security guard until he won a staggering $20 million in the Illinois State Lottery in 1996. After coming into that kind of money, Dampier's life changed very abruptly. He and his wife got divorced, splitting the winnings 50-50. Dampier then began dating and eventually married another woman named Crystal Jackson. Two years later, the couple moved to Tampa Bay, Florida, where they opened a gourmet popcorn store. Dampier was generous with his winnings, especially to Jackson's side of the family. He spent lavishly on cruises and gifts, and when his sisters-in-law fell on hard times, he offered to take care of their finances. Of course, Dampier had a less-than-innocent motive for doing so. He was actually having an affair with his wife's sister, Victoria Jackson. It seems like things were good for Dampier, for a few years at least. Then in 2005, the story took a dark turn. Victoria was also dating another man named Nathaniel Jackson. No relation. Nathaniel knew about Jeffrey Dampier's money and came up with a plan to get his hands on it with Victoria's help. According to Victoria's account, she showed up in Nathaniel's apartment on July 26th. He then demanded that she call Dampier and tell him to come to the apartment. Victoria lured Dampier over by claiming that she was having car troubles. When Dampier showed up to help, Nathaniel pulled out a shotgun and forced him into a van. Dampier then had his hands bound behind his back with shoestrings while Victoria drove the van. Nathaniel repeatedly hit Dampier with the butt of the gun, demanding that he turn over his money. When Dampier proved uncooperative, Nathaniel and Victoria switched places so she could try to reason with him. Finally, Nathaniel handed the gun to Victoria. According to police, he demanded that Victoria shoot Dampier. Shoot him or I shoot you, he said. Victoria then fired a single shot into the back of Dampier's skull killing him almost immediately. The pair drove the van to a deserted road and abandoned it with Dampier's body inside. The body was discovered soon afterward, and the two fugitives were arrested a few days later. At the trial, the defense painted Victoria as a victim. According to her sister Tiffany, Jeffrey Dampier began his relationship with Victoria when she was just 15. They knew she was 15 when he started messing with her, she said where's the justice for her? And according to the defense, Nathaniel had forced Victoria into committing the murder. But the prosecution argued that when she placed the phone call that lured Dampier to the apartment, she knew what would eventually happen. For her part, Victoria felt that the victim wouldn't have blamed her. After the guilty verdict was read, she turned to her mother in the courtroom and said, Jeffrey forgives me. Both Jacksons were sentenced to life in prison, where they remain today. For Jeffrey Dampier, winning the lottery turned out to be a death sentence. His widow, Crystal, agreed in a later interview that he would have been better off without the money. I think it is a curse, she said. When Weird Darkness Returns we'll look at some of the numerous ghost brides of the United States. And gargoyles, aside from looking menacing,
could they also be a kind of protection from evil? These stories are up next. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. A young woman, groom, and some of their wedding guests decided to play a game of hide-and-seek in a large mansion used for the wedding reception. One version of this story says it was the father of the bride's house. Someone other than the bride was designated as it. Some versions say the maid of honor, others say the groom. And everyone was found but the bride. Friends and family searched the house for hours, days, even weeks, a missing report was even filed. Eventually, the groom had to move on with his life. And one day, in the far-off future, someone was cleaning the house. They opened a large chest in the attic and found a skeleton in a tattered wedding dress. It seemed that the lid of the chest shut on the bride when she used it as a hiding place. She was unable to open the lid, and she suffocated to death. Some say the heavy lid crushed her skull. Another legend about ghost brides that I heard growing up involves a deadly wedding dress. There are many versions of this story, too. Sometimes it's not even a wedding dress. The story goes that a dead young woman was to be buried in her wedding dress, but her parents decided at the last minute to bury her in a different dress. Since the wedding dress was expensive, they decided to sell it for profit. This dress ended up in the hands of another young woman, and she needed it for a community dance. The entire night of the dance, the dress gave off an odor, and she felt very faint. Her date decided to take her home since she was not feeling well. She did not make it home alive. Her date told the doctor about the odor. The doctor investigated and found formaldehyde in her veins, which had caused her blood to coagulate and stop flowing. I don't know. When they asked the store about the dress, they revealed that they received it from a funeral home and it had been worn by a corpse. The dancing most likely caused the young woman to sweat, which opened her pores and took in the formaldehyde. I'm not sure why revisiting such dreadful stories bring joy to people, but in writing all of this, it sent me down a rabbit hole full of ghost brides. So enjoy the following bits of paranormal history involving brides, grooms, and haunted wedding dresses. The Old Faithful Inn, Yellowstone National Park The inn itself is already very haunted. A woman staying in room two reported a woman dressed in 1890s clothes floating at the end of her bed. People have also reported the fire extinguisher moving and doors opening and closing. The most interesting ghost, though, is the Headless Bride. People have reported a woman in a white dress drifting across the crow's nest, holding her head under her arm. According to legend, the bride was a young woman from 1915 New York that, despite her wealthy father's wishes, married a much older male servant. Her father provided them a one-time dowry of a substantial amount, 
with the agreement that they would not ask for money ever again and would leave New York forever. They married and headed to Yellowstone National Park for their honeymoon, staying in room 127 of the Old Faithful Inn. On their way to Yellowstone, the groom spent most of the money on gambling and booze. A month into their honeymoon, the dowry was gone. This led to intense arguments between the couple, which was heard by hotel staff. One day the husband stormed out and never returned. The hotel staff thought that they might give the heartbroken wife her space and after a few days decided to check in on her. The maid found the young bride bloody in the bathtub. Her head was nowhere to be found. A couple days later, an odor in the crow's nest led staff to her head. Dauphine Orleans Hotel, New Orleans, Louisiana A young courtesan named Millie worked in May's Place, a bar in the Dauphine Orleans Hotel. The morning of her wedding, her groom-to-be was shot dead in a gambling dispute. Millie, from that point on, and even after death, walked around the bar in her wedding dress. She still walks around the bar in her wedding dress today, waiting for her fiancé to return. The Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas Room 525 is haunted by two brides. Allegedly, two young women ended their lives in the room on their honeymoons, 20 years apart. The room was closed for a time and then eventually reopened for renovations. The renovations brought about some paranormal activity, including apparitions, weird sensations, unexplained leaks, distant voices, and other odd noises. The Hotel Galvez in Galveston, Texas Since her death in the 1950s, a ghost bride haunts room 501 in Hotel Galvez. Her fiancé was a mariner, and she, when expecting his return, would watch the sea from the hotel. One tragic day, she watched as his ship sank and soon after ended her life. She had actually survived and returned to heartbreak. She still walks the halls, scaring guests. One guest in room 501 abruptly left the hotel at 3 a.m. in tears. The City Tavern, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania A bride and her bridesmaids were preparing for the wedding when one bridesmaid accidentally knocked over a candle, setting the curtains on fire. The fire spread throughout the tavern, taking the lives of the bride and her bridesmaids. The ghost of the bride is active today, especially during wedding events at the tavern. Some wedding photographers have even reported seeing her apparition appearing next to the living bride when looking through the camera viewfinder, although no one has caught her on film. Emily Morgan Hotel, San Antonio, Texas The Emily Morgan Hotel resides in a building originally erected in the 1920s. The hotel itself was established in that same building in the 1980s. The building, first used as a medical arts building, is lined with gargoyles portraying a different medical ailment. Such an astonishing building comes with some astonishing ghost stories, of course. The seventh floor of the 13th floor building is haunted by a ghost bride. Her backstory is unknown. Visitors of the hotel have called down to the front desk after hearing loud shrieks. Hotel staff simply reply, we're sorry, but we do think it might be a ghost responsible for that. Hotel Conneaut, Erie, Pennsylvania Elizabeth and her new husband stayed in room 321 on their honeymoon. Their blissful vacation was interrupted by a raging fire in the hotel. The husband was able to get out alive, but Elizabeth was trapped in the room and died. The heartbroken bride still roams the third floor, looking for her husband and sobbing. Wearing a wedding dress, she leaves behind a smell of jasmine. The Alpha Gamma Delta House at University of Georgia, Athens, Georgia The AGD sorority house at the University of Georgia once housed the wealthy families of Athens. The mansion was built by William Winstead Thomas in 1896 
as an engagement gift for his daughter Isabel and her fiancé, Richard W. Johnson. The house is often called the Wedding Cake House because of that. Isabel ended her life in the house after Richard left her at the altar. The house went through a couple of hands before becoming a sorority house. According to several reports, the scorned bride is still active in the house. Paranormal activity includes faucets turning on, lights turning on and off by themselves, doors opening by themselves, and faces appearing in the window. One sorority sister named Sarah lived in the engagement room and described her experiences. The door to my bedroom and my roommate's closet door randomly swing open on their own. I swear that the ghost who lives here is doing it. It really freaks me out. Long Island Campgrounds, Bolton Landing, New York The state campground has 90 sites, over 100 acres. In the 1960s, a new husband and wife decided it was the perfect location for their honeymoon. They were allegedly murdered in their sleep while camping. The bride now wanders the grounds, looking for her husband among the living campers. Phelps Grove Park, Springfield, Illinois When driving over a bridge in Phelps Grove Park, a newly married couple lost control of the car and both died. The bride still haunts the location. She can be seen holding the hem of her wedding dress, and her face is only darkness. Curves, Onondaga Hill, New York A similar story appears in Onondaga Hill folklore. About 60 years ago, a young couple died in a car crash on a very snaky road just after their wedding. People claim to see the bride on Halloween. Her glowing figure floats down the road in a wedding gown searching for her husband. Some say she carries a bright orange lantern. Baker Mansion, Altoona, Pennsylvania Anna Baker, the daughter of the rich Elias Baker, fell in love with a local steelworker. Her father forbade her to marry him because he was of a lower class. She died alone. Much later, the Baker Mansion in Altoona, Pennsylvania was made into a museum and a wedding dress was put on display in a glass case in Anna's bedroom. When there's a full moon, the dress violently shakes, sometimes to the point of almost breaking the glass. Myth says she is so mad she never got to wear a wedding dress and therefore shakes it in anger. Some people often report seeing it dance by itself, with the shoes tapping along. Some Small Town in North Dakota The book Haunted America by Michelle Norman and Bess Scott tells a spooky story of sisterly jealousy in the 1930s. Sisters Lorna May and Carol were complete opposites. Lorna May, the youngest sister, was strong, cheerful, and a hard worker. The older sister Carol was reportedly more attractive, grumpy, and lazy. They both fell in love with the same man, a widower with three children, Ben. Ben chose Lorna May to be his wife, imagining the both of them working side by side on the farm. Carol was very angry shouldn't he be with the prettier one? Shortly before the wedding, Lorna May suffered abdominal pains. Carol was nearby and was sent to get the doctor. She returned saying that she could not find a doctor in town. It's believed she lied about that and even dawdled in town to waste time. Lorna May was rushed to town but died of a ruptured appendix shortly after arriving. Carol then set out to marry Ben. She even demanded the undertaker remove the wedding dress from Lorna May's dead body before the burial. A month after the funeral, Carol was able to convince Ben to marry her. Their wedding was in mid-July in 100-degree heat. Carol looked beautiful in Lorna May's high-neck wedding dress. During the festivities, though, Carol began to sway and grab at her throat. She died in Ben's arms. The autopsy revealed that it could not be heat stroke. The wedding dress had absorbed some of the embalming fluid while on Lorna May. The hot weather caused Carol to sweat, which opened her pores and allowed the fluid to enter. Well, 
I'm back at that same childhood legend, aren't I? Well, if you are planning on getting married in the near future, I might suggest going with a new dress, not going vintage. Gargoyles are depicted with many fearsome faces. They grin and leer down from roofs and towers of medieval churches and have been present there for centuries, warding off evil. They decorate great churches and cathedrals of the British Isles, Ireland, and other European countries. It is traditionally believed that gargoyles were created during the medieval period. However, their history goes far beyond that time to the very beginnings of art, when man created demons to scare away demons. Many examples of these creatures have been found in ancient civilizations as well. The use of decorative water spouts was known to the ancient Egyptians, Etruscans, Greeks, and Romans, and gargoyle-like carvings have been found in other parts of the world, especially in countries that were influenced by European culture and tradition, such as Mexico. They have appeared in a number of different images and figures, and it is said that no two gargoyles are identical. But no one seems to know why. They were seen on the roofs of Egyptian temples, where their mouths served as a spout for water. Also, Greek temples were decorated with gargoyles in form of lions and other animals. Later, these creatures became strictly ornamental and assumed many forms such as dragons, devils, demons, half-human and half-animal as well as caricatures of real people or classes of people. The name gargoyle is often attributed to St. Romanus, the Archbishop of Rowan. According to legend, he saved his country from a monster by the name of Goji, sometimes called Gargoyle. The Gargoyle is said to have been a legendary dragon with bat-like wings, a long neck, and the ability to breathe fire from its mouth that lived in a cave near the Sine River in the 7th century and was ravaging the town and people of Rowan. It was slain by St. Romanus, the Archbishop of Rowan. After the dragon was slain, its body was set ablaze. Its body was consumed by fire, but the head and neck survived and was mounted on a building. Supposedly, the monster was so scary-looking that it frightened off evil spirits. This led to some calling the monster a protector and placing similar carved figures on churches and other important buildings. Originally, the term referred only to the carved lions of classical cornices or to terracotta spouts, such as those found in the Roman structures at Pompeii. The word later became restricted mainly to the grotesque, carved spouts of the European Middle Ages. It is often but incorrectly applied to other grotesque beasts. Gargoyles always have drainage conduits. Other carved beast depictions do not. What's important is not all grotesques are gargoyles, but all gargoyles are indeed grotesques. A French abbot, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, 1090-1153, was famous for speaking out against gargoyles, most probably because he didn't fully understand their role when he wrote, "'What are these fantastic monsters doing in the cloisters before the eyes of the brothers as they read? What is the meaning of these unclean monkeys, these strange, savage lions and monsters? To what purpose are here placed these creatures, half-beast, half man, or these spotted tigers. I see several bodies with one head and several heads with one body. Here is a quadruped with a serpent's head. There a fish with a quadruped's head, then again an animal half horse, half goat. Surely, if we do not blush for such absurdities, we should at least regret what we have spent on them. Even in the United States, gargoyles were used on more modern buildings as a form of decoration such as the stainless steel versions used on the Chrysler Building in New York City, at Princeton University, University of Chicago, and Duke University. Perhaps the most famous are the gargoyles that decorate the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., the sixth largest cathedral in the world and likely to be the last Gothic cathedral ever built. It has 112 gargoyles, rain diversion devices with a spout, and over 1,000 other grotesques, those without a spout. 
When people think of gargoyles, most envision monsters and dragons and the like, but there are also other intriguing and odd figures. More famous gargoyles from history are those used on Notre Dame de Paris. They reside atop dizzying heights and are often unnoticed by human eyes but ever watchful of our movements. They have observed us for centuries. The gargoyles of the famous Notre Dame Cathedral, half man, half beast, preside over Paris and have done so since the medieval times. It is believed that there is no commonly accepted explanation of why these odd carved creatures exist as they do. Why were these figures actually placed atop the buildings? Do they have a symbolic meaning? Were they used for repelling evil or perhaps only for architectural balance? Or were they, perhaps, as Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin suggested, watchmen of the period, guardians of the ancient religious sanctuaries? Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise. Sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Ghosts, A Part of My Life was written by M. Lynch from YourGhostStories.com. Under a Flaming Sky is by Troy Taylor for American Hauntings, Inc. Apollo 20, Journey into Darkness was posted at The Unredacted. The Secret Code Signature of Christopher Columbus was written by Jenny Kyle for Mysterious Writings. How Do Serial Killers Select Their Victims is from the lineup. Inside the Unsolved Disappearance of Jennifer Keese was written by Joel Stice for All That's Interesting. The Cursed Village of Witches was written by Brent Swanser for Mysterious Universe. Till Death, Ghost Brides of the United States was posted at Notebook of Ghosts. No Good Deed Goes Unpunished was written by Wyatt Red for All That's Interesting. The Annie Dorman Mystery is by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. The Betty and Barney Hill Abduction was by Les Hewitt for Historic Mysteries. And In the Protection of Gargoyles is by A. Sutherland for Ancient Pages. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 26, verse 19. Just as damaging as a madman shooting a deadly weapon is someone who lies to a friend and then says, I was only joking. And a final thought. To keep your excuses from making you useless, stop making useless excuses. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, weirdos. You've got a murder, Chef. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, March 2nd. Who killed her? He was wild dog, boy. This couldn't be done by a human person. We'll be spending two hours with Hexen Arcane. Sisters Morgan and Celeste Parker. These sexy sirens, these gorgeous ghouls, will be presenting 1972's Moon of the Wolf, starring David Jansen, Barbara Rush, and Bradford Dillman. What did you find when you examined Ellie? Just that she was murdered. Dogs didn't do it. Like I said. After several locals are viciously murdered, a Louisiana sheriff starts to suspect he might be dealing with a werewolf. He's saying Lou Garou. Come on, how can you go wrong with a werewolf flick, am I right? Werewolf? He's saying werewolf. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun, and even get involved in a live chat as we watch the movie. 
It's Moon of the Wolf on Saturday, March 2nd, hosted by Hexen Arcane. The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. He says that I'm his next victim! Hope to see you March 2nd. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.